For us, I think we really helped shift this idea of you could do best in class, best in breed. You don't have to buy a whole big product by itself. And you can really drive value around that. And, and I think that was, and now I, I think it's common, we sort of get jokes all the time, where if uh, you, you just get like a new procurement startup is popping up every month, it seems like, if not every week, that we get pinged about. They'd be like, hey, have you seen this company that does this automation or this RFPs or this something? So I feel like it's, uh, and not to say yeah. that we did it, but <laughs> we're part of the, the, the wave of new, way, of new tech that helped create that. Let's discover the Cleveland entrepreneurial ecosystem. We are telling the stories of its entrepreneurs and those supporting them. Welcome to the Lay of the Land podcast, where we are exploring what people are building in Cleveland. I am your host, Jeffrey Stern, and today we are telling the story of Alex Yakubovich and Stan Garber. Alex and Stan are the co-founders of Scout RFP a software as a service company that helps organizations with their strategic sourcing and procurement processes. They started Scout back in 2014 here in Cleveland and sold it to Workday for $540 million back in 2019, where both of them still work, leading Workday's strategy and growth in the source to pay space. Prior to Scout, Alex and Stan both attended Case Western Reserve University, where they founded Enosis an enterprise-level digital ordering platform for restaurant chains back in 2008. Their Enosis journey connected them with two former Lay of the Land guests, actually, Bob Sopko at Case Western and Lee Zappas, who they had raised angel capital from before they sold Enosis to Living Social back in 2012. There is quite a lot from this conversation that I am personally working to internalize and apply to my own work. Uh, It was really awesome to learn about their practices, which have allowed them to be successful multiple times over in serial entrepreneurship. I hope you all enjoy my conversation with Alex Yakubovich and Stan Garber. So I was thinking when you survey the Cleveland startup world for success in recent history, that Scout RFP is what you inevitably unearth. You know, a story from Case Western to more than half a billion dollar exit in in a very short time. And it's a story that I've been excited to hear. And I think everyone tuning in will be excited to hear. And so I very appreciative um, of you guys coming on to to tell that story. Thanks for having us, Jeff. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I did learn just on a logistical note, it's it's helpful when there are two guests, if um, each of you could just kind of introduce yourself to associate the audio with, with who is speaking. So um, Alex, if you want to kick us off with a, with a short introduction here. Happy to. So Alex Yakubovich, I'm the co-founder and CEO of ScatterFP and now the general manager of spend management at Workday. Wonderful. Stan Garber, also one of the co-founders and president of, of ScatterFP and now part of Workday, VP of uh, Go-To-Market. Uh, strategy and and that whole approach. So yeah, very similar with Alex and I backgrounds. Yes, which we will, we will dive uh, into kind of cover the whole story here. But before we we kind of delve into the background, I'd love to just start with some context setting a brief overview of Scout RFP today. What does the product do? Who is it for? What is the, the problem you're trying to solve? And, you know, we'll work our way backwards from from there. Definitely. Well, I can take this one. So ScatterRFP has been rebranded after the acquisition to Workday Strategic Sourcing. And what it is, and the the simplest way to describe it is when large companies go out to buy something, they put out a request for proposal, typically, or a request for quote, request for information. And it goes out to a number of suppliers, and then the suppliers get the opportunity to bid. And that's how how large large companies, governments, et cetera, uh, go out to get pricing on services and products that they're looking to buy. So what we did is we we put together software that automated that process for these large companies for them to be able to do it with more suppliers in, in a faster, more efficient manner and get the suppliers, get them answers back in a faster way and, and also manage things like questions and things like that. That's how we started. We'll talk more about the the founding story of that as well, but that, that was our foundational product. Since then, we've also evolved Scout RFP to also include things like contract management, supplier management, and um, other other things around the field of strategic sourcing, which is a 
a discipline and a profession, which is also a subset of procurement. Got it. So you and Stan have been working together for a long time now, pre predating Scout RFP, um, and and we'll start our our uh, our lens backwards since here since high school. <laughs> and when you kind of look back on that that time together, that experience, I, I'm curious to to learn like where your paths crossed and and how that happened, but also from an entrepreneurial perspective, where your paths crossed and how that happened, and and when you look back what those kind of formative moments were that that drew you to building and creating things and not just individually but but together definitely well, and Stan you you can come in on on any part of this story as well both of us have, have uh, shared this story a, a good number of times but we're both Russian and Jewish immigrants uh, our families moved from the former Soviet Union in the early 90s uh, we didn't know one another but we met in high school at Mayfield High School where we both went to school when we met, we, we both really hit it off. Stan started a club called Future Business Leaders of America. I joined that club. And then, you know, during lunchtime, we would we'd get together and we would we were both interested in business and, and you know, in, in the future. But largely is, he could, is, he could, is he telling the story? Could you imagine how popular we were back in high school? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would join the club. Totally. <laughs> it speaks to uh, my popularity. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we would talk about things like, you know, companies and, and uh, we would like also do a little bit of stock trading under, you know, under our stock trade accounts that our parents established for us. And so, you know, we, we really hit it off. And then as, as we were graduating high school and, and going to college, we started a company with uh, another friend who went to brush. His name is Oleg Friedman, another, another great Clevelander and uh, doing website design for small businesses. So, you know, we were still in, in high school and literally we went down Mayfield road knocking on this was 2003 2004 you know knocking on on small business doors asking you know everybody from like jewelry stores to to you know doctor's offices our, our first client was a gynecologist toy stores toy stores totally yeah <laughs> uh, and just saying if, if they need a website design and we did larger and larger projects through that and then you know by the time we we entered college and you know our freshman senior year we were doing like you know, a, a nice six figure business as uh, these, you know, young college students in, in just website design and software design. So that that's how our paths crossed anyway, and how we became both like friends and also business partners. Right. And that's, that's, that's the beginning, I guess, of the, yeah. the impetus for the and what I'll add to that, and this is going to be super cheesy, Jeff. So uh, but I think, you know, the whole Russian Jewish bonding moment, all of that, and like, you know, I think both of us always, you know, your parents, like they, they, they bring you to America. They're like, you need an education, graduate college. If you don't, I'll kill you. But outside of that, like, go be <laughs> successful. And it's like the enterprise of, again, like I said, cheesy, but it's like, go out and be successful, go try something, go build something. And, you know, you read all the textbooks, you see all the movies, like as, as you're exposed to all this, when you get to America, you're like, you can go do it. And that was the mentality we sort of had. I don't think Alex, you know, when, when we talk about it, no one was like, like, we were just like, let's just go do it. It wasn't like a whole lot of calculations at the time of like failure or how not to do it. It was barriers of like, wait, there's one of us old enough to actually sign for an EIN number or to get our Ohio <laughs> certificate. Like those were the challenges that we had when we started any of these companies. But it, there's there's nothing more than just like, go do it. And, uh, and that, that's something we always try to tell young or aspiring entrepreneurs or anybody that's like, how do you do it? It's like, just go do it. Like you'll figure it out. You'll stumble along the way. Uh, I think that's an important aspect is like it's, it's you, you have the platform in America to do that. I don't know. For us, I think that was just a, also another bonding opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine. I mean, it, it is pretty wild that you both have that shared, you know, coming to an America story at the same age at the same time and, and connecting here in Cleveland. <laughs> Definitely. I, I think there's a lot of that in Cleveland. We we hear stories like that all the time of you know, immigrants that came into Cleveland and the community is very welcoming. Uh, we had so many wonderful mentors in Cleveland that we still talk to on a regular basis. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about some of them later on in, in this show as well, but the, we're just very fortunate to be in Cleveland and a place that appreciates you know the greatness of, of being a founder and won't always slam the, the door in, in the face of a couple of kids in, in white shirts and, and ties uh, that are looking to make a sale. Yeah, yeah. 
So you guys kind of catch the the building something bug with this first endeavor coming into college. At, at what point do you start thinking about focusing on a specific problem or a product versus kind of this approach of building a, a business? And, and we can kind of work our way through your time at, at Case Western and, and Enosis. Definitely. We pretty early on, I mean, we, we had a, a good number of web development projects, but it felt like every time we'd start a new project, we would have to learn a new industry, a new environment, a new client base, and kind of like start from scratch, you know? And so we really wanted to go deeper into one industry. And the other things we saw Salesforce taking off, we saw organizations like Workday, you know, really coming into its own. And this was like the, the mid 2000s time period. And we thought, you know, software as a service, is going to be this big thing. It makes a ton of sense, you know, put put something out there and then, you know, sell the the subscription model. So we just didn't know what it was that we wanted to do. And then Rascal House Pizza, the Mike Frangos, uh, you know, Cleveland icon, he, he and, and Rascal House Pizza, which we knew really well from, you know, being at Case Western Reserve University and ordering online at early on, they had a, a pretty rudimentary online ordering system and they wanted to redo it. And we loved ordering online from Papa John's, who had really invested a lot in their online ordering system. We thought, you know what, like in the future, every restaurant chain is going to want people to just order online. It makes a ton of sense. And we as consumers love this. We hate ordering over the phone, especially late at night. You know, you're on hold. Your order isn't always right. You can't pay online. So then you got to like figure all of that out. Whereas with online ordering, it just streamlined this whole process. So we thought, you know, why don't we build the system for um, and by the way, we're, I mean, as college students, you know, pizza and pizza ordering is near and dear to our hearts. So yeah, we thought, absolutely. why don't we build this? And then we could resell it to, we'll build it for Rascal's Pizza and resell it to other restaurant chains as well. And so we, you know, they, they didn't have a huge budget, but they they were open to allowing us to maintain the, the rights to the license and go out and, and sell it to other folks. And and they were also just a, a completely wonderful first client in in just working with us to build something that other restaurant chains loved and gave us really tremendous feedback. So um, we'll always be grateful to Mike Frangos and Nico Frangos for, for giving us that first shot. And then we went and we sold to Pizza Pan and Zeppies and, you know, like all the all the other local pizza chains. And then we got into like Papa John's, Outback, Carabas, Panera, Boston Pizza, Corner Bakery Cafe. We, we went into over 50 restaurant chains eventually, but early on we figured we, we wanted to do software and not just web development projects. Right, right. And this is all while you are still at, at Case together. Yeah, the idea the idea really started going junior year. It was like when we were sort of like really full blown with it. We started working on sophomore year and junior is when we actually had a product. And senior, we started getting some of those other brands that Alex mentioned interested. And the funny thing about that is, and something that was interesting about Case is we, like Bob Sopko, and, oh, yes, yes. and some of the other folks at at Case, we you know we we, we were looking for like a place where we could work. Love Gonick, former CIO. He was amazing at Case Western. Hugely influential, and they hit us in in one of the school buildings in the attic of one of the school buildings. And basically, the the whole thing was like off the books. Don't ask. <laughs> like, don't here. Here's some key cards. Don't tell anyone you're up here. But but this is great space that nobody's using that you can you can leverage, and that again just kind of speaks to that welcoming uh, quality and also the fact that Case has always had like entrepreneurship in its its genes to a, a large degree. And we were like a beta incubator almost before incubators were a thing. Right. <laughs> but we just scrapped it together, but with the help of of other you know wonderful individuals that were there. And then Bob Sopko, we were looking to raise a little bit of of capital so that we could really focus on the because we saw the online ordering business taking off. And Bob Sopko introduced us to Zappis, Lee Zappis, Zappis Capital, and Rich Bongiorno. And to this day, I, I we're, we still marvel at the fact that like Lee and Rich met with these you know. Little, college kids and decided to put half a million dollars into our business. And that was that was all the money that we'd ever raised. And they were just tremendous partners while we ran Onesis, which just stands for online ordering systems through the so we graduated in 2007. And then we got a an acquisition offer from Living Social in 2011. But by, by that point, we were working with about 50 restaurant chains through the world. 
Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an incredible story. Also, you know, huge shout out to, to Bob and Lee as well, who have both been on the show and, and told their own stories respectively, but it, it just makes a lot of sense to me. Totally. <laughs> Was there a higher level vision? Like what was the plan to take over the world through pizza ordering software? Or was it, we're just going to keep growing this until we meet saturation and, you know, obviously transpired in acquisition, but was that kind of the goal? No, I think for us and Alex jump in here, but, uh, you know, we looked at it for us, we, well, we, our niche became, um, and it would have evolved maybe as time gone on. But for us, we found that, you know, the chain restaurants, you know, setting up an independent versus a big one. And there's a lot of complexity in menu structure and how you can feel, not going to go too much detail, but it, it could be quite a daunting task to build out all the toppings, the pricing, the tax code, you name it. It's very complex. Point of sales are not an easy product to build. We didn't realize it because we didn't know it until, until we were in it. But what we found out was, uh, so for us, we basically had a spreadsheet that were, what are the biggest top 150 restaurants in America? And for us, it was a laser focus, where, how many can we get? And that was it, because they controlled, when you look at it, you know, you get your Subways and McDonald's, then you have a lot in the middle, the amount of location they control, it's pretty high. Uh, it's about half of the restaurants out there compared to the independents. And so we went after that. And I think at our peak point, we were almost near 50 out of the 150 that were either piloting or had rolled us out or in some level of beta with our product. That was sort of like the, the, like, if we can get to 150, that was the successful marker. We got up to 50 out of the 150 uh, at our peak point, I believe. We'd also love to tell you that we had a grand plan, but one of the, the best pieces of advice, and we still, we still echo this advice, is advice that Lee gave us, which was, you know, we didn't have an, an exit strategy, uh, even though that was and still is probably a pretty popular thing for entrepreneurs to have. But Lee always told us, if you run a, a great cash flow positive business, you never have to worry about your exit strategy. Like you, you will always have plenty of options and you can keep, you keep going, keep growing. Um, you can go public, you can you know, be acquired, whatever. And so we never worried about that. We just really focused on very, very much focused on just building a, a healthy, strong business that served customers and kind of just let, let the rest take care of itself. And eventually we, we did get approached by Living Social, which during the daily deal craze, they, they raised, you know, a billion dollars and were incredibly successful at the time. And so we, they were looking to acquire an online ordering company to close the loop with the daily deal coupons. And honest, this was a natural fit for that. And it, it worked out really well for everybody. So coming out of successfully building and exiting Honestus, um, in retrospect, obviously you guys were still driven to build uh, and create something with the world of possibilities that you could have possibly focused on, what was it about sourcing and procurement that drew you to the space? What was the original problem you identified? How how had how did you guys just come to encounter this? You know, it was our own pain point. I think that really stemmed a lot of that curiosity to get in this space. And uh, when we built Honestus, we you know sales it was like Alex Alex ran. Uh, I started focused on sales. Alex ran operations. Oleg at the time focused on the, the product. And when I mentioned we'd focus on these big restaurant chains, 50, you know, like the top 150, guess what? They got to go through a buying process, which a lot of the time meant each issuing an RFP. And there, there was one in particular that just never will escape me of the story. Just uh, one big national chain it took us five years of our adult life to get this, to get the, them as a customer. And in those five years, four different RFPs of four different project managers, and twice they would email us like, hey, did you have a copy of the bid you submitted last year? And I'm like, well, I have a copy, but how come you don't have a copy? And it was just one of these. And, and um, you know, I think uh, over drinks one night, Alex was like, he was like, what do, you, what do you hate more about an RFP? I was like, I was like, don't even talk to me. RFP suck. Like, I don't want to deal with it. It's like, but you hate not being invited to one. And I was like, yeah, I know. I want to be invited to one. I want to choose if we don't respond. So um, it was this natural curiosity and our pain point. And we, then we just started talking to folks and we spoke to about 300 people, made a list, and we, we just started talking to individuals. And we just saw that there was a lack of software and adoption and the products that were out there, these big giant uh, ERP products out there weren't being used and people were not passionate about them. They disliked them. They, 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 they bought them. It became shelfware. And it was one of those moments for us like, there's an opportunity here. Like there's a real pain point that we felt and there's a lot of individuals that are feeling it too. And I think that that's what that, that, that curiosity sort of 
like snowballed with, with everything else. So you have those conversations, you see it, you see folks spending money on this industry, but not actually getting value around the service. And, and for us, that was, and what we loved. And I don't know, this Alex and I, uh, it is it boring software that, that was ripe for disruption, right? Like it, it was just like all the little success, to, like all the little things were there to show us that this space is big. Uh, and so we, we sort of fell in love with it really quickly. And procurement folks, they're fun to talk to. Like what I think uh, somebody's asking me, I was talking to a procurement leader yesterday and he was like, oh, it's like you guys are selling into the worst like individuals to, to like, because they're negotiating with you all the time. But like, we love it. Like there's the nicest people. <laughs> As long as you're doing, you know, you got to have the, the process. But yeah, they, they care about the, mm-hmm. their company and they care about making it successful. And if you can empower them, that was uh, that was for us. And I don't know, Zendesk was a great example when we were thinking about this because Zendesk at the time was really good doing their, when we were entering, was just going through like their like real big inflection growth. And they made customer success sexy. Like people were flying, like, and that wasn't something traditionally you were, you'd think about that. And we were like, let's make procurement sexy sort of the, the thought that we had, we jokingly did. And that, that, that was how we jumped into this. It's interesting. It, one of the patterns that has like very strongly emerged to me just having these conversations is how much opportunity there is in making unsexy things sexy. There's just like constant across industries, waste management, procurement. I'm working in healthcare credentialing. For some reason, it's because, maybe because it's unsexy that it, people don't think about it that Solving much. Solving business problems that have value like people are good are going to pay money for that. That that that's the reality to make these problems not go away, but just improve it. Well, one thing you mentioned that I I want to dive a little deeper on is you mentioned three hundred conversations. That's a lot. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> at what point do you build the confidence along that journey to say we understand the problem? We know there's a product that we can build to to solve it. W- what is the MVP? How do you think about gaining your your first customer and 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 bringing to market something from a really extensive research effort like that definitely talking to hundreds of customers is it sounds daunting and and it took us months and months to do it almost a year actually but if you break it up into industries and take into account the fact that we didn't really know procurement and we're coming into the industry as as new folks with with new eyes which was a real advantage we, so you talk to some in government, some in, you know, different industries, some in education. We just, once you break it up, it's, it's really, the sample size has become pretty small in each of the areas, especially when you look at like, where is the beachhead that you want to, you want to first really land and stick to. So we heard a lot of the same themes across all of the industries, but when you got into the nuances and especially where there was software that was decent and where there wasn't software, where, where there was a real need and a real pain point, you know, we, we started really pinpointing around that. And then we started digging deeper into it. But I, I think we, we got a high level picture pretty quickly early on, but it did take time to really understand the different markets and to really understand and, and get empathy for these customers because we didn't come from the industry. I think if, if we would have been in the industry, it would have taken us less time and we wouldn't have had to do as many interviews, but we also probably wouldn't have had as fresh of a perspective as we did. Plus we were building a really big pipeline while we were doing these interviews. So that's the other part. We kept going because people kept talking to us. And, and a lot of those customers, or rather a lot of those people that you were interviewing maybe became customers. The later paid to... ones. Yeah. And to Alex's exact point, like we just didn't know what to ask exactly. We didn't know, uh, cause the first like 20, 30, 40 conversations, you're sort of just trying to understand what all the terminology they're throwing at you back. You're like, you know what an RFP is. And they'll say like RFX. And I'm like, wait, what's an RFX? It's like, Oh, that's a general statement for a request for whatever. Like these, these, you know, you, you just don't know it off the top of your head right away. And uh, it just takes a little bit to learn the industry and the terminology. And then you find out that, like, oh, I've been asking the wrong questions for the first hundred. Let's modify it. <laughs> In college, Stan and I had two really great friends, Andrew Durlek and Chris Crane. And we recruited them to start this together with us. And so we, we were doing these interviews together, which was also really helpful that we weren't doing them all, all ourselves. And so the other thing that, one thing that I give Chris a lot of credit for is, you know, he just, he coined this term monastic simplicity. The, 
thing that we kept hearing from these interviews was that the software that existed, and there's a lot of software from SAP, Oracle, IBM, you know, at the time it was just a daunting number of procurement vendors out there, uh, procurement software vendors. But the, the word we kept hearing was clunky. And so we would ask companies what they used and they would tell us what they have. Uh, but ultimately they were just using Excel spreadsheets and email uh, because the, the software that was out there was just too much or, you know. And so what we really focused on, and, and I, I give Chris and Andrew a lot of credit for this because this was like a really big push on their part is, you know, just making software that was just super easy to use. And they really nailed that first use case, which was just sending out a request for proposal to a number of suppliers and getting responses back and managing the flow of questions. And it was just such a small use case that oftentimes we were thrown out of consideration from some of the larger customers who were looking for like a full-blown supplier you know, portal or something like that. But customers that did that had an acute RFP pain point that used Scout in the early days just loved it because they didn't need a training manual. They didn't need training. They could just use it right out of the box immediately that day, which was unheard of. You know, usually it was like installation over months and then you had to go through right, right. Michigas. They they really nailed that that first use case. And then we we grew the rest of the software out of that. But that ethos of and philosophy of this monastic simplicity was what really became Scout's brand and how we were able to grow so successfully. And was that the first thing that you had built? Uh, or was there an iterative process that got you there where you were kind of feeling out what that first niche thing should be? Yeah, we our first value was obsessed over the customers. And so we that was the first thing that we built. But then we would go into a, a prospect or a customer and we would say, well, how is this? And they would say, well, we can't use it because it doesn't have this. And then in a, in, you know, in a mm-hmm. day, in a week, we'd come back and we'd say, okay, how about, how about now? And they'd be like, oh yeah, <laughs> now we can use it. And so we would, you know, we would continuously do that. And we, we used uh, kind of like crossing the chasm and knocking over the bowling pins analogy. You know, we, we, we found industries where they just ran a lot of RFPs and there was a lot of benefit to it and a lot of pain point. And then, we kind of like focused on those. We started getting small network effects from from those, you know, them word of mouth and them telling each other about this. And this is the tools that we use for this. And like Stan said, these are wonderful individuals in a great community. And then we started as we grew. We would just maniacally listen to our customers, and they would say something like, "We run a lot of RFPs, but we don't have really software that helps us see what's going on across the whole portfolio of our RFPs." So then we built a product called Pipeline. Uh, which just like it sounds is like the pipeline of all the RFPs that you have running. And there was no system of record for strategic sourcing that that was as really purposely built for strategic sourcing, like we built pipeline for it. And so there were a lot of great tools out there, but anyway, we, we just iterated based on what our customers said. And in the time between, you know, starting Scout and, and exiting to Workday on a macro level, a pretty, you know, compressed timeline for, for building something from scratch, growing it really at scale. How did you guys kind of manage that process? And I imagine, you know, some of the advice that Lee had, you know, mentioned uh, with the first company kind of translated here as well with no necessarily exit strategy in play and just building a a good company and kind of seeing what happens along the way, what your options are. But uh, as the company grew, how did you guys kind of think about that and and contemplate, you know, what is the impact we want to have with this business? So that uh, This could be like the next two hours conversation, right? <laughs> um, and we went through a whole, uh, a pretty big, it was a big growth moment for all of us, right? As, when, when we started thinking about this, the one thing that, you know, Lee and Lee Rich, they invested in us, so did, so did some other great like folks at Morris Wheeler, uh, Hard Manel, like invested us in a Cleveland and, and helped us. But one of the things we, we, we did decide to, 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 to try out Silicon Valley, just to sort of think about that, take out some investments. NEA was the sort of, sort of the first lead on there and others came on and it just sort of gave us this, like, how do you build a real machine? Like repeatable revenue, how do you think about building every like group with regards to sales? Like there's a whole engine and a whole factory on how the sales will run, how CS will run, how product will run. And coming out here really gave us that exposure and help to, to think much more bigger 
Like, how do you really build a repeatable, predictable model and, and revenue and engine around that? And, and really the whole, I think we kept saying the factory internally in, in all of mm-hmm. our meetings, like how do you build this factory? And everybody's running different processes in the factory. There's always a fire somewhere. You always got to put it out, but um, it just elevated everything. I don't know if you want to dive into something specific uh, or do you want to focus on there? Cause we could, we can go pretty broad here. I can share a couple of just quick principles that we we started with. the The first one is we knew we wanted to we had we had a vision. We knew we wanted to grow a large organization. So you know we we knew we wanted that scale. And the one of the things that we learned really well at Honestus, but also at Living Social, was the value of union economics. And so for us, we knew that if we were going to build a great organization, we would have to be able to scale profitably over time and, and eventually in a healthy way. In the beginning, you're, you're burning cash and that's just part of the, the scaling process, but that should yield a company that stands on its own two feet eventually. And so that was something that you know, Chetan Pudagunta from NEA, he was the partner that joined our board um, and the reason why we moved out to San Francisco to, to run Scout. We just really focused on, you know, how do we get to positive union economics? And then once we do that, how do we scale? And then at that point, we were just, you know, looking at things like our average, we just kept a close eye on our union economics. But then you look at things like average sales price, you look at things like the cost of sale, and then you figure out where your bottlenecks are. And anytime we got into trouble, which was pretty frequently, especially in the early days, you know, of running a startup, you see a lot of problems. But when we'd go to see Chetan, who's, who's our only board member in the early days, you know, he would just draw a funnel on a piece of paper and you'd, you'd be like, this is where you're stuck. <laughs> Here are the ways that you get unstuck at this part of the funnel. And that really clarified for us what we needed to do in order to continue scaling at the pace that we needed to continue scaling it. It's a spot on, Alex. And what, what the other part of this is, advice at least I've given a lot of founders too, is to that point where you sort of draw the funnel, right? Because you start a company and you're like, what do I need to focus on? There's a million things you need to do. And to that point, like one thing that we that we really try to do well is we sort of did the jobs of all of the roles almost in the company before, you know, you bring anybody else. But so you start at the top of the funnel and you're like, all right, like you've got a product, you build an MVP, like what do you need now? Right. So now you need, you know, to get some folks interested. So what that that's the business development or it's the sales development roles, the SDR, the BDR. So like, go do that. Like, all right, how do you get people's attention? What's the content you need to create? So go create that. It's not going to be perfect, but you do all of those roles first to really understand what the art around that is. Then you're like, okay, now I've got some people looking at it. Okay, what do I need to actually do to get them to actually, now you got to demo the product. Can you demo the product? Then can you, hey, do you have the legal to get the contract in place? What's our SLA? What's this? Oh crap, I need to go do that. And you literally move down the funnel. And then once you get to the bottom, you got a few deals, you quickly realize you need a lot more of them. Then you go back up and you're like, all right, next evolution. I've gotten some leads. Now, how can I scale that? Okay, let's go hire a person or two to help scale the BDRs. Then then you're like, all right, I've got more inbounds. I can't do all the demos myself. Let's hire the first round of AEs to help there. Okay, now we've got, you know, like now we need to support customers. Let's get a CSM outside of us doing it. So it sort of naturally flows. And I know it's a very simple, like you're like, yeah, I get it. But doing that in practice is actually hard and, and, and breaking it down and just like go back to what the business needs today. Now what the business needs six months, like, you know, just like you're, you're stuck in the early days figuring out the first part of the funnel, then work your way down. Now, it's it's just practical advice. And that that that's what when Jathan was doing the funnel, he's just yelling at us in, in a very good way <laughs> to be like, focus, like solve the problem at hand here. Jathan called it running from one garbage fire to the next. And that's kind of what it felt like. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a, I'll dive in on that a little bit. Like, as you're growing the organization, how how are you guys, you know, yourselves keeping up with the the pace of growth? And you know, one of the things I, I find really cool and and interesting about your story is that it's not it's not just like a one time. Like, you guys have done this together multiple times over, and I imagine you must have like seen how each other has grown with the respective organizations that you were building. And so I, I want to just kind of ask, like, how how you guys have seen each other kind of develop over the last few years, and specifically what you would say each other's kind of superpowers are in the in the organization building journey you've been on. Well, one thing we did that was really successful is we we defined our roles very quickly and what we each owned early on. It was also really easy for us because Stan was always much more 
go to market and customer focused and and sales focused and I was always more operationally and product focused so it made that easy and with Andrew and Chris they they helped to make that to fill in a lot of areas where we were pretty weak too so it's really just a, a wonderful partnership all around but I think the the key to it in the beginning was to make it and all throughout was just to make sure that each of our roles was incredibly clear and what one system that we use for that not that there's one system that that's right or wrong but the business model canvas by Alex Osterwalder uh, we used that early on just to lay out all the areas of work to be done and then we assigned clear ownership of who owned it and then we all pitched in to do all the work but there was one person responsible and accountable for every area that made it really clear as far as Stan's superpowers I'll, I'll speak to that he Stan is better with customers than anybody that I've ever seen and customers just absolutely love Stan Part of that is because Stan absolutely reciprocates it and, and loves the customers right back. And it's it's that intense customer focus that, like I said, it was our first value and Stan just absolutely lived it. And especially in the early days when you're scratching and clawing to get your first million dollars in ARR, it made all the difference. And I think that's where a lot of companies don't succeed is they're doing it either for money or for love of technology or anything else like that. And one thing that we were always very much about is it was we were doing it for the love of customers and like the magic of seeing customers get a ton of value out of what we were doing. We, it, it, to be honest with you, like as many years as we are into it, it's still the main thing that drives us today. But Stan's superpower is that he's, he's better. He, he's just incredible with that. Well, thanks, Alex. And we're simply <laughs> back to you. I think one of the amazing things that, you know, and, and I'll say it and then just to, to add a little more to, to, to what you were saying earlier, one thing Alex has done just so well and, and it's so hard. It, it's, it's keeping again. It's one of those things. It's easy to say, but just keeping the us on the right like path. And there's a lot of shiny objects, and I'm the first one to admit it. And uh, they only let me in a few product sessions at any given time throughout the course of a, a calendar year, even a quarter. Like I'm like, guys, these customers need all these awesome things, and and we need to do these things next month or next quarter because we're gonna get all this revenue, right? I'm that. I'm like that. Like. I'm that individual within the company that's like hyping it all up. And Alex is like, I hear you, man, and we're going to do it. But here's what we need to do first. And we're going to do these things. And then we're going to do these. So it's like really to, to, to the point of us, like really breaking it down. And, and this is where the operational excellence come in. It's like, look, you can't say yes to 30 folks and deliver 30 things. You just can't. You got to go through a certain set of process. And to that point, you know, a lot of that comes back from, I think, two things that's made us very successful because a lot of partnerships don't work out. You know, and this really is a marriage, like where you you got to work at it. And there's definitely some highs and some lows. I, I would think of us, Alex and I are like brothers and we're going to we're going to butt heads a lot. But ultimately, we sort of are aligned when we leave a conference room, uh, when we leave anything like like we may disagree, but we disagree align and, and, and have one clear message to the rest of the organization, whether we're going my direction, his direction or or just slightly like not perfectly. It doesn't matter. Like when we're out to the world, like we're one message across the board. I think that's so critical. And we have a lot of respect for each other. Like, I think that's the other thing that that's really, really important. It's not about the ego. It's not about whose name is going to come first. It's respect for what you do well. And like, we're going to back each other up. But there's plenty of meetings where I'm like, Alex, you know this, like, you're right, we can't do this. Or vice versa, like, we need to do some type of conference or branding or sales. He's like, Stan, like, what's your vote on this? Like we'll designate, like we'll defer to each other. And, and there, there is that level uh, of true respect between one another that, that I think makes this work very, very well. So when you are finding individuals to work with, like that, that like make sure you can have that because that, that's, that, that's going to be so critical for the long run. Otherwise, it's just going to be tough to have that back and forth because there's a lot of not great moments in, in startup land. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> How, how did the the acquisition transpire? What what is the story of of Workday? We adm- have admired Workday since the beginning. Honestly, since Onesis, frankly, you know, it's kind of like Salesforce is the the real you know one. We actually wrote out who we wanted to like admire, like who we aspired to be. Like there was three companies on that list, right? And Workday was one of them because of the way that they treat their employees and their employee first, and they have this incredible culture, but they're also very customer oriented, but their whole thing is you take care of your employees, they take care of your customers. 
And we just, we love that. We love the fact that the, the like customers love the software and the fact that they like the, their culture is such a big part of how they've grown. And so we were really proud when they became a customer, really proud when they became an investor and a partner. And we were going to market together and we were selling more and more deals and we had more and more overlap. And we, everybody that we met at Workday was just first class, just super bright, incredibly high integrity. And we really, really enjoyed it. We met with their CEO, who we really, Anil Bushri, who is just like a world-class guy. And then we we raised our C round and we're scaling and we're scaling really quickly. And then we we were approached to raise the next round preemptively, pretty pretty unexpectedly. And we we were going down that path and we met with Anil, uh, who basically said, listen, you know, we'd love to see if we, we love our partnership. We'd love to see if we could potentially bring you in if you'd be open to it. And we we weren't looking to be acquired. We they, you know, we didn't have a, people ask us like, did you did you use a banker or anything like that? Like we didn't do any of that because we we were on the path of growing our company and hopefully going public one day. But Anil is is pretty persuasive and Workday is just like a wonderful world class company. And Stan and I knew we had a lot to learn also about working within a larger organization, serving larger customers, serving customers on a broader scale. We wanted to do more in procurement than, than strategic sourcing. We wanted to expand further from that. And we were years away from being able to do that as a as a small private company. And Workday was like, here's a platform that we think you, you'll be able to do that in a much sooner time frame. And then also we looked at the type of home that it would provide for our employees. And you can't find a better you know place to work than Workday. And so, you know, we took that all together. Uh, we talked to our board and who had you know, incredibly complimentary things to say about Workday. And then, you know, as they say, the, the rest is history. I don't know, did, did I miss anything there, Stan? There's a couple of glasses of wine with Anil. There, there, there's a lot more details of that, but that's not for this viewership right now with this particular chat. But um, <laughs> I, I, I think for us, it was just, it was an opportunity to, to really elevate what we were doing. Like we became best in class. And to Alex's point, Workday, uh, we didn't even know it had an enormous practice in this. And it gave us an opportunity with, on a megaphone to go compete against the Oracles, the SAPs, the, like these big, big, and, and learn something at a different level. And it just it raised the stakes so much faster uh, across the board. And we've been able to see the power of that, like landing customers in seven-figure deals now. You're like, whoa, like it's just, it's impactful. So it's a, it, we saw it firsthand and it, it was just, it was a good opportunity. And we said there was like, there's only one company this could have worked with and that's what it wouldn't work with a, otherwise we'd still be independent building this thing. Got it. And both of you are, are still, you know, Alex, you mentioned earlier, like drawn to this, the value that the customer is getting out of it. It's still the same under the umbrella of the same product and direction that you were working before. Or how are you guys, how's the role changed? How are you thinking? you know, maybe looking a little bit towards the future, like what comes next? What, what are you guys thinking about from that perspective? Yeah, well, it, it's evolved quite a bit since being acquired to, to what Stan was saying, that the stage is just much bigger because now we're looking at, certainly we're still looking at strategic sourcing and working really hard to maintain a, a strong leadership position there and also not lose the the reason why our customers love the software in the first place. But now we also get to look at things like how does it work with the workday procurement suite and workday inventory and supply chain suite and put it all together and the you know one of the promises of our of this industry that we're really passionate about fulfilling is when you buy a suite it all should work together and it's all you know a magical beautiful thing but the truth is a lot of the suites have been stitched together from different software platforms or just built by different individuals and they they don't really work smoothly together and it's not a great customer experience and as you can probably imagine from you know hearing us talk here we're <laughs> we're passionate about delivering on that promise of uh, delivering that great customer experience and we're we're not there yet we still have a road to go and we're still in the you know we're we're less than two years into the the workday journey so there's still a lot of work to be done to to really achieve one transformative product that's easy to buy adopt and love but we're excited to get there that's awesome I'm curious from the competitive landscape, like how much looking back do you feel that you've 
been able to kind of change the industry? Uh, you know, you've identified all these problems uh, up front. Like, w- what has been the impact? What What have you guys been able to catalyze from from having the scale and reach that you have now? There's a lot of great companies in this space, just to be crystal clear, and, and a lot have come before us and paved the way one to the like. So it all builds on each other. I think one thing that we came in with a very different perspective, and the the best part is we we sort of used our experience building on top of each other. So when we did the online ordering, we understood the complexity of what it took to build uh, easy, like how easy it had to be to the end consumer. Right? You don't care about all the complications that it to to create a pizza, the toppings, the half versus a third of the pizza, the, all this stuff. It doesn't matter, but it has to be seamless and easy, or you're just going to drop that order and go somewhere else. But then that idea said, well. Like when you look at consumer facing UI, it's beautiful and simple, but enterprise tough sometimes. Like you're forcing your organ, like your folks in that are very expensive, highly talented in this, you know, four, four walls, and they're struggling to use the products that they're designed to help them. And for us, when we went into this space, we said, we're going to make it simple and easy and intuitive. And that really forced a shift where I think one of the publications eventually sort of created an article. I think they called it, what was it, Alex? They called it a scout effect or something, mm-hmm. where literally you had some of the biggest competitors out there that had to redo their UIs, their, like, just how the, the, redo how they thought about it. And they brought those uh, up to their conferences three years ago, and yet they still have yet to, like, they created the visual, mm-hmm. but getting it together is hard because it's, it's tough code that's been around. It's legacy code that's been around forever. So for us, I think we really helped shift this idea of you could do best in class, best in breed. You don't have to buy a whole big product by itself. And you can really drive value around that. And and I think that was, and now I, I think it's common. We sort of get jokes all the time where if uh, you, you just get like a new procurement the startup is popping up every month, it seems like, if not every week that we get pinged about. They'd be like, hey, have you seen this company that does this automation or this RFPs or this something? So I feel like it's uh, not to say yeah. that we did it, but <laughs> we're part of the, the the wave of new way of new tech that helped create that. So for me, if I had to sum it up, I think UX, UI, and, and Alex's point of being, and Chris's idea originally of like being so simple of how to use, and actually simple, like that drives, like it's not about every feature. It's how do you use those features to get the job done and to make it super intuitive for everybody to be part of using the software. And, and, and I challenge that with like in anything we do in the future, like that has to be it. And that's the approach that we're, we're doing. We're bringing this to work day too. I imagine that's very cool to see in the market, the true impact of the work that you guys have done. It's awesome. Yeah. I just remember one, one funny, like the Gartner, so Gartner at one point, and like, we were just never like, we weren't big enough for the longest time to get like to the views of Gartner's. But the analysts, what we, we spent, we took care to make sure we, we just talked to them, let them know who we are. We were small at the time. And then like mm-hmm. you get to the analysts and they would always be like, like they're not, they don't qualify for anything, but every customer we talk to just says we love and it's simple and they don't have any problem using the software. And every time we talk to all of the, like the big companies that they use, all they hear about was how complex it is. No one's adopting it. And it's just sitting there. And like that, that, that little wave and that like industry support over time became such an important piece. And those analysts were like, maybe you don't need this big behemoth product sets to get the job done. And just our customers' voices help them realize that. I do want to bring it a little bit back to Cleveland for a moment. Uh, I'm not going to ask you if you're going to start a new company here in Cleveland. <laughs> but I, I am curious, you know, as much as like Scout is kind of heralded as, as a, a genuine Cleveland success, it, it also, in my experience, is kind of identified as emblematic of some of the challenges that the Cleveland startup scene faces, where growing local companies can't always find in, in, in your words, you know, like the factory making support that they need to kind of scale to the next level and, and are essentially forced in some cases to explore some other uh, geographies and, and hubs that, that offer that kind of support for, for growing companies. And, and so I am curious what your reflections, perspectives are on Cleveland's role in, in Scout's journey and, you know, where it does a good job and where you feel like we can do a better job. Yeah, I feel strongly about this. So I think we're a good use case for this because we or at least good people to ask this question of because we we did. We built a company in Cleveland and Onesis was fully, you know, a Cleveland company still is in, in Cleveland. And we 
loved that experience. And it was successful. We were able to find the talent that we needed and some you know, really wonderful, amazing individuals, some of who are, are still there. Uh, and we really enjoyed that as well. When we started Scout, we the reason that we, we didn't have to go to San Francisco. In fact, our, our board member said you, you, we were contemplating different places to, to go to just to, to see what it would be like to run a company in a different area. And he just said, listen, either stay in Cleveland where you have a great network and it's a wonderful place to build a company, you know, lower cost structure, people who you hire can actually buy houses and, you know, all this stuff that that is pretty challenging in the Bay Area or come out to the Bay Area where we're, you know, we'll all be together and you could, you know, have an an office space and, you know, build a Bay Area company close to VCs, all the other stuff. And so one thing that Stan and I stress is that having done both, you could totally do either one and be really successful in either direction. It was more of a personal choice. It wasn't like we had to leave the region to build a company. In fact, we we knew for a fact that we didn't have to leave the region in order to build a successful organization. The other thing that you asked was what advice we would give or like what would make Cleveland a better place for building. And the only thing that really comes to mind, and I think it's less of a factor today than it was, and you see Cleveland companies raising outside capital readily today, it, which was not the case before. And it, you know maybe it's because so much more is done on Zoom than it was before. But <laughs> capital was, there's just a lot of capital in the Bay Area. And so in order to meet with capital here, it, it was in some cases for us as easy as going around the corner and the, you know, we, we had quite a few VCs that were just based on where we were located in South America, literally located right there. And so it, was, it, it did make raising capital really easy and meeting venture capitalists really easy and going to events where it was, you know, and there's a lot of money in the region. I think COVID's really equalized a lot of that. And also there's a lot of capital just out there now, and they're looking for the best companies, not just um, the closest companies or, or the most convenient or the most vocal founders that, you know, you see at all the networking events. So I think it's made it a lot easier, but at the time it wasn't the case. And so definitely helped. There is a lot of, uh, I, I know Alex and I both have invested in in startups in Cleveland already mm-hmm. in the last year. Um, so th- there, there's a lot of good stuff happening uh, across the board. And uh, I will tell you at the end of the day though, it's like uh, sometimes you do got to go like we're to, to Alex's last point, like, you know, like at Workday was a two block, two buildings away from us, right? It, it's easier to get partnerships mm-hmm. and deals. And I think you will always get that now, especially in today's market being remote, it's going to be so much impactful. But I do think you can, uh, you got to be open to traveling and getting ready to meet people, especially as the world opens back up. But that's going to be a critical part. Cleveland's also, it's a good centralized place. Getting to Boston, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, like Texas, like it's still a great, great spot to do all of that. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, well, wrap it up here with our, our final question, a question that we ask everyone who is uh, on the podcast, which is also a Cleveland question, but not necessarily for your favorite thing in Cleveland, but for hidden gems or other things that people may not know about that you like in Cleveland. You know, for me, I just, uh, uh, when I think of like, for some reason, food always pops in the head for me, like when I think of, of that area. Alex, I think I know what you're going to say, but uh, I'm going to go with, and we spent a lot of time brainstorming ideas there celebrating uh, Johnny's Little Bar. I feel like, and I, don't, I hope it's still oh. around. I hope it's still around. Yes, yes. There's just like no better place to like brainstorm an idea to celebrate or like grab something late night with like at that place. It's just, it's so amazing. Uh, from And that's a great value. Uh, for me, and you don't appreciate this as much when you're in, Cleveland, but when you leave it, you you miss it dearly. The Cleveland Museum of Art is an incredible place. And the fact that you can go for free. For free. And as a college student, as a as a an individual in a community anywhere, and just go into the Cleveland Museum of Art and see some of the best pieces of art and be inspired by that. And then also just the the environment that they've established there such a beautiful atrium, such a beautiful grounds outside of that with the, you know, with the pond and everything like that. Just um, every time I go back, I, I make it a point to visit. And it reminds me how fortunate we are in Cleveland to have that, that gem. And I wish we 
had more places like that. But you know, I regardless of where you go, it's a world class place, and it's located right in Cleveland and accessible to everybody. What a gift! Yeah, it's incredible. I actually don't think anyone has mentioned the museum yet, and that it is fantastic. It really and is. If you're thinking of that, just go to the Botanical Gardens or or, or to the Natural History Museum. Boom. You got them all in a row. There you go. <laughs> well, Stan, Alex, thank you again very much for your time and for uh, sharing sharing your story today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. It's our pleasure. If folks have anything they want to follow up with you about, what is the, the best place for them to, to reach you? LinkedIn's really simple. If you just link us in, just grab our profile, send us a message. We get it on our phones. So it's not like we're, we're, we'll, we'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Awesome. Well, well, thank you again. Thank you. Cheers. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. So if you have any feedback, please send over an email to jeffrey at layoftheland.fm or find us on Twitter at podlayoftheland or at sternhefe, J-E-F-E. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please reach out as well and let us know. And if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or on your preferred podcast player. Your support goes a long way to help us spread the word and continue to bring the Cleveland founders and builders we love having on the show. We'll be back here next week at the same time to map more of the land. The Lay of the Land podcast was developed in collaboration with the Up Company LLC. At the time of this recording, unless otherwise indicated, we do not own equity or other financial interests in the company which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of any entity which employs us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.